you're gonna fail. Like, and but by saying fail doesn't mean like the ultimate end is doom and you you failed. But clearly along, along the way of the path to growth, man, you're gonna screw up so many times and hit your you know fall flat on your face and skin your knees and all that. It's a part of it. Brooks Conkle, it is good to have you here in Economics. It's great to meet you today. I'm looking forward to having our, our conversation. How are you doing? How are you feeling these days? Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Um, yeah, look forward to connecting with you today and having a good conversation about entrepreneurship, income, etc. Same here. I, I I go through and you know when I look at what uh, what people are up to, um, I always it gives me somewhat of a sense of you know what kind of conversation are we going to have. Um, some guests. You know, they're, they're highly granular, highly specific into like their one area. Let's say they're running a service or something like that. And they really want to get into it. So we have those kind of conversations. We have conversations yeah. where we just go off, like blast off of the space, you know, talk about mindset and manifestation. I, I, I did not expect to be able to have those kinds of conversations when I <laughs> signed up for this. So I'm super grateful to have them. Um, today, my prediction is, you know, this is a... Um, uh, th- this is a general interest episode. This is really about inspiration. It's about mindset because um, you have a, you know, a wide variety uh, of activity and projects and that's really been your, your bread and butter. So that's everything that I'm going to say to warm this up. My opening question to you is to tell us what you do and what are you up to these days? It's funny. I wrote an entire article about what is it that I do uh, and listed the different ways that we make income because friends would ask me that exact question and honestly it's been it's been difficult to answer over the last dozen years um you know the the shortest answer is I'm an entrepreneur we make we make income in a number of different ways from real estate real estate is probably our largest income source uh and that started that started for me in the in uh when I returned to, I returned to the country in 2007 I was actually in New, in New Zealand and came back and the first thing I got involved in was real estate and that has uh that stayed with me since but we have yeah we have over a dozen sources of income you know uh online sponsorship online content um and we can you know we can go we can go as specific as we want uh into into those as you as you like Joseph yeah, there, there, there are some areas that I'm definitely keen on uh, asking more about. Uh, but what okay. stuck out to me was also the difficulty in answering the question is, is you know, is what you do. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I've been asking that, you know, um, uh, almost from the start, although at first it was who you are, what you do, which I always thought was like, why would I do that? I already say their name. So it just made them repeat their name seemed like a, a, a like an easy fix. But the what yeah. you do has always been been tricky, but it's always a great way to open the, these things up. When somebody asks me what I do, I'm, I'm specific, right? I, you know, I, I host, I host a show and then yeah. I, and I manage stuff, um, uh, behind the scenes at the beautify in addition to, you know, my, my secondary tertiary pursuits outside of the company, writing some dabbling in animation, um, playing games, stuff like that, passions, hobbies, and so on. But when I tell people that I do a podcast, I do so knowing that I'm going to get pat on the head, like, Oh, that's good. Oh, that's, that's, that's cute. So you, what I, right? so if, if I'm in the mood for that, I say that, but if I want to, I guess, come across with a little bit more prestige, I say that I'm in radio. And I'm not lying because podcasting is an, el- an evolution of radio. If you distill what podcasting is to its essence, it is communicating via airwaves. I mean, you know, in, you know in my mind, this is an audio show uh, 95% of the time and then the other 5% we turn on screen share. So that's how I've distilled what I do. And then yep. I can continue to distill as, as much as I feel is, is necessary. You know, I can say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in communications or I'm in media. I guess once I get the media, that's the bedrock. I, I can't really go anywhere beneath that. So have you ever had to, have you ever tried this method? It's have so, you tried distilling what you do yeah. down to the essence? So it's really funny that you mentioned that you have these different layers depending on maybe who you're talking to or how it comes up in conversation. So that's what my wife and I have these discussions all the time and how, why it's so difficult to um, kind of, yeah, I'm not like, oh, I'm an, I'm a, I'm an attorney. I'm a CPA. I, I don't, I don't have that answer. The, the, the biggest general answer is either business owner or entrepreneur, you know? Um, and if someone wants more information, let's, 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 di- let's dive in, right? Let's dive deeper. We can talk about creating uh, online content or we can talk about courses or we can talk about real estate investing or we can talk about, uh, we produce events. We've actually produced events. We produce a publication locally. I have a local media company, um, and so it re- like that. It's it, 
it really depends on who I'm talking to and how how that conversation goes. Maybe it depends on what what we talk about. I guess about about what we do. Um, there's definitely a lot, a lot to pick and choose from. I, I feel like I've just uh, stepped into a buffet and I'm like, okay, don't go for dessert. Don't, don't go for dessert. Don't go for dessert. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'm going to go for dessert. So 20, <laughs> you, um, I, I read this, so uh, either I saw it on like, YouTube or on the website, or, or maybe you just mentioned it, but okay. it's there. It is, you know, 20 income streams. Um, I, 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 I got the right number, right? Or maybe, maybe it fluctuates. Maybe it's like, I don't know, a little, little up, a little down. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right around there. So technically 19. And I sat down, I sat down to write an article to explain to my friends uh, what I do. And I thought maybe it would be a handful. And some of them, a few of them, I'll go ahead and tell you, like if if if, if a listener out there reads the article, um, I even say it in the article. I'm like, yeah, you can debate if this is income. You can debate this one if it's income. But I wrote it for me and like my definitions. And yeah, it ended up being like 19 ways that we bring in, you know, bring in revenue to Kunkel Inc., which is what we kind of call our family, our family company. So, um, yeah, so it's like technically 19 streams of income. I mean, I could literally go through them and then you could tell me <laughs> that's interesting. Nope. Or nope. Yep. I, I, no, I'm, 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 t- I'm tempted to do that because, you know, I do have my, you know, I do got to fill an hour. So it, it, that, that would be one way to be like, all right, yeah, yeah, let's go through all 19 of them in, in detail for me. It's just like when, you know, when, when kids get their, their questions, like, uh, solve this problem and then show your work. So I, I'm tempted to do that. Um, the way I would want to ask it is, mm-hmm. I guess, to go through the building blocks of this. Like, I don't, I don't suppose all twenty of them came through all at the same time. I think it was a matter of, you know, it was iterative. So you had some of the earlier ones that allowed you the means, I suppose, to start adding these other ones onto it. So that's how I would want to. I think that would be the most valuable thing for me, especially, is you know, what was a starting point and how you're able to get to where you are. So presumably, all nineteen will be brought up over the course of this. Yeah. D- yeah. Definitely did not have all 19 at one time. Uh, definitely. They have ebbed and flowed. Definitely. Some of them are minuscule uh, income streams where some of them are like much larger income streams. Right. So all, all that is uh, for sure. Um, I said, uh, and I even, I even in, in this article, I talk about like, Hey, um, so yeah, I kind of disclose, I don't say like, Hey, here's what I make from each, but I say, I'll read you this line. So it says, for the past seven years, we've made a net income between 35 grand and 150 grand. So that's net income for my family. Just so people have an idea of like where I, where I stand as a, you know, as a, as a business owner. Um, and so, so someone can gauge from that, maybe listening, like, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not like some, I'm not some big shot multi, multi-millionaire uh, yet, right? Like, um, but yet it's interesting, like how, how diversified, uh, like I really am or, or have become, I mean, I'm, I'm more diversified than I even realized that I was. So, so, so you, you had that opportunity to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to do this self analysis, um, almost to the point where you know, some of these come up and it's like, it's like that internal debate you're having, do I, do I, do I count this as a, as an income in kind? And then, oh yeah, yeah. Th- th- then it counts. And then the other thing I noticed too, cause I was going through that article um, briefly as mm-hmm. well, is that, so you had you had mentioned the 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 net, so I, I might have dropped as like you know thirty to hundred and fifty is mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not yep. the best at retaining numbers, yeah. and one of the things I think that you pointed out too was that that might seem like a, a, a there might seem like a disparity there between those two those two points. Now, is this a matter of that's like over the course of a year that's best case scenario versus worst case scenario? So I just kind of threw out threw out a range of the last like seven years, kind of what we've what that income's kind of grown, you know, like grown to. Um, you know, seven seven years ago, there was much less income from these income streams, you know, and seven, you know, and and now in the current, it's it's much greater. I guess is kind of what my point of doing that was just to, just to show people like what can what can happen over a period of seven or at least for us like what happened over the you know the last seven years or so so okay so i i, I want to hear about uh, some of them in specific um and and i'm especially angling towards um you know for for our audience um many of whom like myself um would uh, would love to be able to start building this um maybe some of the ones that are good that are starter friendly maybe weren't the start for you maybe they came on later anyways but um, what would you say are some of the ones that um, are ha- really are, are accessible? Some of the most accessible ones that somebody can look into. 
I mean, it's, uh, I hate to sound so general. It's like all, like all of them. Like really, but really, I think it um, it probably starts with a personality. It probably starts with interest level. You know, it starts it starts with all those things, right? Like so. And we were talking about how real estate, for example, which is like the bulk, which is the bulk of our family's income. But we were talking about how real estate is probably one of the hardest to get involved with, you know, get involved in if you have uh, little to invest and whatnot. But I would, I would actually sit here and say, nah, that's not necessarily true. You just have to be more creative. So when something takes a bigger investment like real estate, you have to be a lot more creative. Like, for example, I'll just throw a few ideas at you real quick, if you don't mind, like now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I'd love to hear uh, it. So you could, like, so I'm actually a licensed real estate broker. So, which is like a real estate agent, basically. So you could get your real estate license. If, if, like, if you're wanting to, let's say, buy and flip a property, if you're wanting to buy a long-term rental, well, obviously it takes a lot of money. Well, go get your real estate license. I actually advise people to get licensed because it gets you, if you have any interest in real estate whatsoever, it, it gets you involved in your local market. You become, you get in the know about what's going on in your market. You're able to network with the other real estate agents that are out there buying and selling properties. You'll meet a, a lot of other investors because a lot of real estate agents are investors as well, like a percentage of them. And what can you do? You can sell properties for people and make commission, which is income, which you can then invest into maybe buying a property down the road, right? So that's that's one thing. What if you what if you met someone that could invest with you? They have the capital, you have the energy, you go find the deal, you go get it renovated, and you have like a profit split and a profit share, right? You just got you just got yourself involved. And I I I I've done this. So actually when I my start in real estate was before I got my license. I talked a guy into going into business with me. I, I found him, basically hunted him down, had a coffee with him. Um, we got along really well, talked him into going to business with me. We ended up starting a company together and, and bought, renovated, and sold close to a dozen houses. Uh, and he's still, so we no longer have that company because I got my real estate license. He kind of went a different way. We're still really good friends today. Um, I had zero dollars. You know what I mean? I had I had no money, yet I was able to form a company with a guy that was able to help me help us find the financing. Um, and then us, you know, buy, renovate and sell a number of properties over a number of years. So definitely if you're, you know, if your listeners are like, I want to get involved in real estate, but I don't have the funds. Uh, there's so, there's so many ways to get involved in real estate that does not involve having like a ton of, a ton of capital. One thing that, um, uh, sticks out to me though, is in the, in, in, in coming across as the, uh, as a, you know, as a salesperson in some way, right. You're, you are selling houses. So there is yep. uh, a great deal of, of sales to this. Um, if I were to say, draw an equivalence to somebody who's, uh, selling cars, but they don't drive one themselves. There is a disconnect there between their ability to sell the car versus them having one of them own. Now, I it's not a it's not a a one to one parallel because even if I don't own a home, I know how to live in one. I've I've lived in one most of my life. You know, I live in an apartment right now, so while I don't own it, I I know what is the you know, what what is the experience of. But nonetheless, um, is there something to watch out for for somebody who you know is not a homeowner themselves to then be in the position to sell homes for others? For sure. Sure. Right. Um, so what you say, what you say is definitely, definitely has validity, right? Like, so every year there's, you know, new eight brand new agents that just got their license. They're brand new in the business. They definitely don't have as much experience as the, you know, more seasoned agents. Um, maybe they, like you said, maybe, maybe they've never owned a home themselves and they're getting in, involved in real estate. Like, uh, it's okay. I mean, I, I think it's perfectly fine. Like you have, you have to learn somehow, but like, in that situation, what I would recommend is so when when you get a if you get a real estate license, most states require you to hang your license with a broker, uh, with a brokerage company. And so you know, like maybe you could work with a more experienced real estate agent on like a team, and then learn and then learn that way. Um, so maybe you really kind of get your feet wet uh, in in that sense in that regard, and and you're not just out there on your own trying to sell something that you don't completely have you know, years and years and years of knowledge and experience on. So 
So I've I've been in in sales before, um, n- namely in, in in watches, and uh, in, enjoyed it immensely okay. for the for the for the most part. Uh, and it was, and I would say I was fortunate to at one point be able to even um, work in the in the luxury market because it meant you know taking phone calls. For, we we had you know, we had politicians, we had you know we had lawyers. We had, basically, we had people who could afford the watches. Yeah. And um, I, I'm a, I'm I'm tempted to tell. It's not really relevant, but I do think it's a funny story. If you don't, I'm just gonna uh, I don't get to tell it very often, so I'm just gonna tell it. So you know, people would would order the watches online, and then if they wanted to, they would come pick it up in person. And and this one uh, uh, gentleman comes in, and he and I ask you know, I ask him you know, what's, you know, what's your story? What's, uh, what interests you in this watch? And he said, well, you know, I, I just survived, um, uh, cancer. I got a, a clean bill of health and, you know, and this watch is to, is to commemorate that. And I said, oh, wow, that's amazing. And he says, yeah. And, you know, and, and I said, so, you know, having gone through that, what did you, being the interviewer that I am? So having gone through that, what did you, you know, what, what, what was your, your big takeaway from it? And he said, well, it's just not not sweat the small stuff anymore, you know, not to stress over the little things and to really, you know, appreciate life in its, in, in its grand scope. And I said, well, that, that, that's incredible. Uh, so he, he opens the watch, looks at it and he's looking, he's looking, he goes, have you, have you noticed that there's like a little bit of an odd bump in this, in this, in this leather band here? I don't yeah. know. Should it, should it be that way? And I'm just scratching my head going, Oh no, <laughs> oh, no. Uh, he's, he's not, he's still sweating the small stuff, isn't he? So that it just, it was just funny to me how the, the irony of that did not, uh, did not occur to him. And I wasn't going to say anything because you know, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to sell the thing. Uh, <laughs> So I mean I'm I'm not I'm not tired of that. That was just a funny story. I haven't had a chance to talk about it in a, in a good long while. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was the competitive nature of sales, um, and and I'm curious about the 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 balance between the cooperation and the competition in selling something as you know, as, as as grandiose and I would say as limited in quantity as as homes. You know, if I'm in the store, somebody comes in and wants to buy a hundred dollar watch, it's okay. Six more people are going to come in. They're going to all buy a hundred dollar watches. But in homes, these things are it's an investment of your time to you do know, to work with people, show them the multiple homes. It's it's a great deal of time. So I'm really curious about the competitive nature of it and how you um you know if you have to deal with other people selling in the market as well. Yeah. So it for sure it's a competitive i mean it's competitive industry right like any other like any other kind of high level sales uh there's supply and demand it, what's really interesting in in real estate right now like as we're recording this is I, i'm not sure about you know your markets i know it's pretty uh, solid across at least the united states it's pretty solid that a lot of markets are really heated right now um so What's causing this? It's all, it's all, it's a number, it's a number of variables. Uh, you know, a lot of it is pandemic related, people leaving large cities and going to less expensive places. So I'm in, I'm in the state of Alabama and uh, it's much, much less expensive here than it is, for example, in, you know, expensive West Coast areas and whatnot. So the supply is very low and the demand has increased. And so right now, the hardest thing is just to find a home. If people, it's, so it's, 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 uh, I don't want to say the homes sell themselves right now, but if you, you almost have to be a salesperson to s- sell yourself to talk someone into selling a home or to doing that, the competition becomes like in today's market right now, the competition really is not even necessarily with, you know, other, uh, other agents or other real estate people. It's really with the supply itself. It's like the competition is trying to find. Uh, I I need to find homes for people. Um, So that's really interesting to see. But then I was also involved in our market in approximately 2008, that ballpark where there was an economic recession, pretty big crash, large supply of homes. And so that's really where you had to really bring out a lot of marketing chops and say, man, how how am I going to, how am I going to get this house sold? Because there were a lot of there were a lot of properties on the market at that time, so it's uh, it's really interesting to see like the ebb and flow of you know real estate in particular in the in the and and we're talking in the case of a real estate um, agent or a real estate licensee, right? Is kind of the the lens that we're looking through that we're looking through this. Now, I to tell you, I haven't been. I've I've been very non traditional in my real estate career. So you like you heard me you heard me mention earlier. I talked about uh, I, I found a guy and I started a company and we bought and renovated houses. It was only after a few years 
that I decided to then get my real estate license. So we decided as a company, we said, oh, well, like, if I get my license, I can then sell our properties. We can save money on listing our homes. And that's where, that's kind of where my path to getting a real estate license uh, even started, which then eventually led me to, uh, you know, having our own brokerage. My, my wife and I had our own real estate brokerage for a, a few years. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an interesting path, which to me, like, I, I love that. And so I don't know if your listeners, um, like that. But I love the idea of knowing that I'm heading in this, like this direction, but I don't know the exact path to get there. Um, I, I know that I know the steps right in front of me and I have some kind of long-term goals, but it's so exciting for me not to know exactly, you know, maybe three years from now, what it's going to look like, like my day to day. Um, I love that. And it took me a while to get to that point, I think that scares a lot of people. And at one time that did scare me. Uh, but I fully embraced that probably over the last probably five years of being a business owner of not knowing what's kind of around the bend a few years down the road. And I, I flip and love it, man. I mean, I, I, like, I really do. I really love it. Yeah. I, I've, en I've enjoyed it, um, at, at times, but to I guess summarize my my, my character is um, uh, I, I do I do tend to have a hard time with that um, with a lot of that uncertainty. So like for sure. for, for instance, I was doing uh, background acting for a number of years and I enjoyed it immensely. It's one of those jobs I'd be happy to go back to if I can uh, scrape the time aside for it. Um, and the beauty of it was. Although it was highly repetitive on the day because they would do the same scene, take over, okay, back to your ones, back to your ones, back to your ones, one more time, one more time, one more time, which is BS. One more time is never one more time a little inside baseball for you. And I love the idea that every time I showed up on site, it was something different. Um, uh, in like the rare case, they had to reshoot something because there was a continuity error. But for the most part, it was it was constantly something new. And I and I and I love that. But I I also had very little, I guess, um, you know. It, it stake involved or initiative, I didn't have to do too much. I we just show up, sit around, and then take orders for 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 a few hours. So that was that was great. Um, in the in the position that I'm at now, and I don't mind being transparent about this, but it's not easy with the nature of e-commerce and how much a, 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 our company is constantly expanding and changing. So there's a lot of recalibrations, and I'm. It's been hard to um, get used to that because. For more for my anxiety go to go down, I have yep. to get used to things, and there's no, and there's very little to actually get used to. I'll throw this back to you in just how you've, um, I, I guess, how you've gotten to that mindset. Um, but before I do that, what I've noticed, and I've only been trying this for like the last three days, so this is a very new initiative. But what I've tried to do is start to appreciate each day as something significant on the calendar because it is. Today is, as of recording, is August eleventh, twenty twenty one. There's only one August 11th, 2021. So what makes this day count? It, it's uh, the inter inter you know, interviews, obviously, they're, they're a highlight for me throughout the day, but it's not just those. It's what else makes, makes this day significant. So that's how I've been conditioning myself to start to embrace this, but it hasn't been easy for me. I love it. Uh, I, lo I love that example. So, so, um, what, so one of the, one of the so events, so I talked about producing events. So we actually produced a series at a co-working space in my local community. Uh, and it was called Entrepreneur Screw Ups Failing Forward. And the whole, the whole point of it was to just bring in some local entrepreneurs and it was, um, to talk about, dude, you're gonna, you're gonna fail. Like, and, but by saying fail doesn't mean like the ultimate end is doom and you, you failed, but clearly along along the way of the path to growth, man, you're going to screw up so many times and hit your, you know, fall flat on your face and skin your knees and all that. It's like, it's a part, it's a part of it. And so it doesn't mean, now don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt to get punched in the face. Like it, it hurts. It hurts to get punched in the face. But I think just knowing that like, okay, Hey, things are going good right now. So I'm probably gonna get punched in the face at some point, you know, coming up. It's almost just like knowing it's coming makes it, makes it less painful and you just you're able to keep cruising um so that's that's one thing we did that we created that series and the whole point was to tell people it's okay like it's okay if things don't always go your way like we have this uh uh and, and i'm sure you know this from all the interviews that you've done we, you know we have this we have this thing like 
uh, like we're recording this podcast and we have to, you know, we're putting on, okay. You know, it's almost, it's almost like it's a show. It's the same thing as, as any social media posting. It's only the highlights. It's only the good stuff, which is okay. It's because you don't think to talk about the negative or you don't think to say, Hey man, let me tell you about how this, uh, this bomb for me. Like that's not, that's just not a normal, it's hard. It's hard to catch that on Instagram. It's hard to catch a failure highlight. It's just, it's just tough to do. So I think when you can, you know, do things and have real conversations with other fellow entrepreneurs and talk about, uh, some of the screw ups and mess ups, it's, it's a good thing. Um, I actually created this thing. I have this saying, so you mentioned what you've been doing the last three days. And I think that's really cool. It's like, it's you appreciating the present moment. I have this saying that's become really important to me over the last couple of years. And I, I made a, I just made a video on it because I got back from Colorado. And the saying is this, it's a Haitian proverb. The saying is mountains beyond mountains. You're like, okay, like what the heck? Like, what is it? Brooks, what does that mean? What, like, what is I, I looked it up. That was one of my questions I had prepped, but the audience, oh, they need to be caught up on it. I, I, I love it. So like, I, yeah, if, I mean, to share that with your audience. So to me, mountains, it's really simple, but it's just, it's a Haitian, it's a Haitian proverb. And what it says is, is that like, Hey, you know, you climb, you go mountain climbing, whatever you're hiking. You, I don't know if you've ever been hiking before, but it, it, it can be tough. Like you're going uphill, you're going downhill, whatever you get to the top of the mountain. Maybe there's a beautiful view. You're like, man, I just did that. That was incredible. But like when you when you look out in the distance, there's more mountains. And so like you you have you have like two two rules of thought there. Oh, like this sucks. I have all these other mountains to climb. Or like, yay, I have these other mountains to climb. Either way, it's like you just have what you said, which is today, and you have the hike, is what I call it. So for me, when I remind myself, hey, man, there's mountains beyond mountains, it's to remind myself, that, hey, man, enjoy the journey, enjoy the hike that you are on right now. And there's your entire life, there's going to be more mountains, like, which is good. It's bad. It's easy. It's hard. It's scary. It's all of it. It's just a part of it. So enjoy the, enjoy the, uh, enjoy the journey. You know, I really appreciate you, you, you sharing it with us. Um, I, I think if over, you know, over time, you know, you talk to different people and, it, it reminds me of this, um, you know, I went to Catholic school. So in 11th grade, they did this thing called world, world religion, very open-minded of them to actually explore other religions instead of yep. just, you know, another year's worth of uh, why Jesus is great. Jesus yep. is great, but you know, there's other things that are great too. And, and they, they showed us that within all of the religions, every seem every single one of them all seem to have the same golden rule, which is, you know, do unto others as you would have done unto you. And what I think is is helpful is in you know in, in the mountains beyond mountains is that I've seen the 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 philosophy behind it in other in other ways. Other people have said it, not exactly in those words, but in other in other methods. I even watched an, an anime where the whole premise of the show is to find out at the end that you should have enjoyed the journey rather than wait for it to end the entire time. And it encourages uh. the, the viewer to go back and start over and actually try enjoying it this time instead of, because what it does is it's, it's a young boy who's trying to find his father. And so, you know, the, the audience spends the entire time being like, you know, when does he find his father? When does he find his father? Oh, he's, oh no, no. Now the father's putting him through another test. And so he finally, well, spoiler, meets the father at the end. And the father says, you know, it's all about the journey. And then the audience says, oh man, I, we were so caught up on the yeah. end point. We didn't enjoy ourselves. So that is so, so like you just telling that story kind of gave me tingles a little bit. That's really cool. I'd be interested to watch that. Maybe you can, uh, maybe you can send me a link to it or something. Um, it's a, it's called a Hunter Hunter. It's Hunter. It's, Hunter. it's, it's a masterpiece. I, I absolutely love it. Sorry to spoil it for you, but you know, uh, yeah, you probably would have, I mean, in the first episode, you get the impression he's going to find his father. So that part's not, uh, not going to be a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. No, that's really cool. It's, uh, I feel like, I mean, this is going to sound a little philosophical, but I, I feel like if you can figure out what we're, what you and I are talking about right here or trying to discover, like, it's almost like that is, that's the secret sauce to life. Mm -hmm. and, well, it's, and it's about the distance. I mean, it's, it's all of it. It's about the distillation, right? Because what did I say? You know, when we talk about the beginning, is you know, I say podcast. I distill that to radio. I distill that to media. I distill that to communications. No, actually, I don't. Communications and media, or maybe one or the other. That's part of work in progress too. And yeah. what I, so I think I've I'm circling around what what the answer is. 
um, which I've brought up in uh, in like the last uh, John Mack episode, which I <laughs> so I love having him on because that is like huge mindset uh, uh, 101. And the purpose of it is to actually find ways to make the destination take longer to get to. If we if we find if we and uh, you know I do have to integrate um, spirituality into this because you know in, in a lot of belief systems it's about being reunited with your creator. The idea is instead of you know leaving this um, this existence, meeting up with our creator right away. To me, it's actually much more logical and probably realistic, assuming you know all of the assumptions uh, heard the two within that the next chapter is actually going to take significantly longer. And the next chapter after that is going to take 10 times as long as the two. So our mission is to actually put as much space as we can from now to the destination, because the longer you take on the journey, the, the, the more you'll, you'll unearth, the more knowledge you'll gain, the, the better off you'll be. And you almost look at destination as like, oh, this is actually the most tragic part because now it's over. And we've done everything we can think of to keep it going. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, that's good. I like that. It's a it's been it's been a work in progress, but I, I appreciate being able to share it with you. Uh, actually, I had a couple of other just to go, just to go back to the real estate uh, uh, for a few more moments. There was yeah, a, sure. Um, something else that I was uh, uh, interested in, in mentioning to you because you 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 had um, commented about you know what might be the the housing situation here. Now I don't like you know look at the uh, the market too intently or anything like that. It's more about my you know my observations. What kind of signs do I see up? you know, people that I talk to. So strictly speaking, anecdotal, but the issue that I'm finding, at least as far as our city of Toronto goes, is is all about the efficiency of construction. They want townhomes and they want the townhomes to be, you know, blocked into, into a group so that you have quite a few of these. Uh, and then condos are almost as plentiful as Tim Hortons. And that's saying a lot. Um, Tim Hortons is the McDonald's of cafes up here. We also have yeah, a lot of McDonald's too. I should have just said that. Uh, I got you. And w- what sticks out to me is they seem to the only options that really seem available um, as far as you know the the city goes is to have to purchase something that's actually going to require a great deal of continued payment on a month to month basis, maintenance fees, you know, pro- property fees, bills, and then you know your your, gen- your general day to day living expenses. And at one point. I didn't think I could afford a home at all. Now I have a tangible goal. It's going to take a while, but I actually have you know a path to get there. But now the new intimidating factor is actually the ability to afford it on a day-to-day basis, let alone you know the 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 one-time down payment now between mortgage. Even my you know my friend he lives in their 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 homes their townhomes, but they're treated like condos. So there's maintenance fees, having to yep. you know um, manage the park, take out the trash, uh, snow removal, and all of that. So. Uh, th- those are those are just the thoughts that I wanted to collect out loud. But what I would like to hear from your point of view is, when is someone really ready to become a homeowner? Like, uh, you know, if, can you go as far as to actually quantify a uh, an annual income for them to really be ready to do it? But it's a good, but it's a good question that you're asking, um, and it's a good, it's a question that I think is different for every person. I think you'll have professionals that are um, financial planners, CPAs, real estate agents. They'll all have different answers for you on, you know, a banker. So a banker, you know, a mortgage company may give you a loan up to X. You may qualify up to X. I don't know. Do you want X as a as a mortgage? Do you want Y to be your mortgage payment every month? I mean, like just because you qualify for something, does that mean that you should take it? So I leave that up to I leave that up to a consumer to decide. But it's good that you you're asking not just hey what's this monthly payment can I afford it you're asking the total cost of ownership which is all of that right it's the insurance is going to be different uh, your maintenance taxes property taxes right so like adding up all of that is what you have to decide. So I'm probably one of very few real estate brokers who does not go around touting home ownership as being necessarily better than than renting a property. Why do I say that? Now like long, long term, yes, I think owning is one of the best like 
it's one of the best like assets you'll build and best best investments for you. I, I agree. I I would be on that side of the fence. But the general blanket statement of owning is better than renting is I, I would completely disagree with that. And I could argue so many, so many reasons. Um, for example, personal. I'm renting right now. And let me let me I, I can explain. We just as a real estate broker, I'm renting my property. We just sold our home about seven months ago. Um, why? Well, our market is hot. And so my wife wanted to stay in that home for the next four years. Well, she came in and toured this place where we now live. And she said, wow, those are really cool amenities and whatnot. Okay. Well, like, I guess I would live there. Okay. Then our market got crazy. We said, well, if we can sell for this crazy price, we're willing to sell. We ended up selling our home to one of our neighbors without ever even having to put our house on the market, right? So we so we sold, moved in here. But here's what's interesting. When I did, uh, this place seemed to be a lot more expensive than our home. I was like, ah, I don't like that. But when I I pulled out the old handy uh, spreadsheet, put all the all expenses, the total cost of ownership and total cost of being here, including utilities. I've since found out that my utilities here are about half of what they were at my house. It has now made living here literally the same exact cost as it did uh, living in our home. So now what I don't have here is I'm not building any equity in this property, right? So within a few years, we will be searching for another property that we can renovate, uh, renovate and move into. But yeah, there is no, there is no blanket answer for all people. And uh, I'm sure people would love like that magic answer, but like, there isn't one. And like people have to decide what are their personal goals. Here's another example why someone shouldn't necessarily be ready to buy a house. What if you're gonna move? What if you wanna be what if you wanna be mobile? What if you wanna be a little bit more remote? Like my wife and I have decided that we want to do that. Um, it's tougher if you have ownership in a property because you have no you have no choice but to either rent that property out if possible. Um, or to sell the property to get out from under it, right? So you're you're less flexible when you own a property. If you lease a property, you're a lot more flexible. So flexibility is flexibility is a huge one, a huge reason for uh, renting versus owning. I think one um, uh, a, a subtopic that I think is uh, is worth bringing it up at this point is also because I know you talk about Airbnb um, oh, yeah. as one of the you know as one source of revenue. So because you know, when you're when you're saying and I'll, and I'll just tell you you know sort of how you know my partner and I are looking at it is you know she wants to take a shot at um, at Hollywood. So going to LA is going to have to come up at some point. Yep. And but we also you know we also want uh, property if for no other reason than to uh, have that investment. And so. You know, renting it out as an Airbnb is at least one option because uh, uh, you, you know there's there's positive and negatives to it. If you have a consistent renter, it's consistent income. Um, the, if you have Airbnb, you have the flexibility of accessing it when you know we so desire. If for some reason we head back, so actually, I'm uh, so so broadly speaking, um, the the question that I throw it to you is uh, just been your your experience with Airbnb and how that's in how that in particular has been either both to your benefit and detriment. Yeah, it, like that's a that's a good one. And you mentioned a few things that I think are really important for Airbnb folks. So I, like I put a lot of content or recently I've actually been putting some content about Airbnb on my YouTube channel, like things that I've that we've learned uh, over the last seven years of being involved in, in Airbnbs. So we had we had three units. We just sold one of the properties during the kind of price increase. It was actually better to sell than it was to keep. But like we've learned a lot. And um, I like to tell people that if you're going to go into the Airbnb business and you want to run and operate one, like you're no longer in the really the landlord business. You're really in like the customer service business. Uh, you're now you are now the front uh, the front lobby of the hotel rather than a landlord. I mean, yes, you own the property, you're still re responsible for, for typical things like a landlord, but you're, you're now, you're up a level, right? You better step up your game a level above that in the sense of customer service. People also look at the, the gross rent amount that they can get for operating an Airbnb and they're like, man, if I rent it, uh, rent it, I'm just going to use standard numbers because the country and the world is different, right? Oh, if I, I can rent this for $1,500 a month or something. Uh, but if I Airbnb it, I can get $2,500 or $3,000 a month. All true. But 
clearly the costs are different as well, right? The cost structure is different. So don't just use those blanket numbers and think you're making more money because your revenue is so much higher for Airbnb because your costs are dramatically higher. Uh, cleaning expenses being one. Utilities are probably the next biggest one that are all on you. Like you're providing those, not the, not the tenant. Um, and then furnishing a property. I think people really under, underestimate the cost to furnish a property. Like for us, it's been ballpark uh, probably seven to eight grand ballpark for like a two bedroom property is what it's cost us to get, you know, fully, fully outfit the, fully outfit the property. So, um, those are probably the biggest things to think about if someone wants to, you know, get involved in Airbnb. Yeah. So just, uh, just to touch on cleaning very, very briefly. So, you know, in, uh, in the event where someone is unable to clean it on their own, they probably have to hire somebody to come in yep. and do the cleaning for them, which means one more person accessing it than I think they might be comfortable with. Yeah, totally. Um, and there are there's some pretty cool tools for that. So there's there's smart locks where you can give people codes. Um, you know, if you're not if you're not super familiar with the you know, or you know have personal relationships with the cleaners that you're hiring. Uh, the people we've worked with has been someone that we have relationships that have actually cleaned our personal home before. And so it's been really good. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an added expense. But if you, if you get a good system there, it does allow you to operate remotely. Like for example, we were able, you know, this last month, we actually did a kind of a test pilot of working out West for the, well, for the month. And we were able to operate our Airbnbs remotely with our, you know, with our cleaner relationship. And so, um, can can be done remotely, and I I know a number of people that operate uh, Airbnbs remotely as well. So right, well, uh, I'm gonna we're, we'll I, I can only, that's as uh, as niche as I can go into that line of questioning. So um, sure. I, I'm I'm checking the clock, and it's uh it's already um uh, two fifty out of uh like fifty minutes so far out of the conversation. It's just been uh, breezing along. Um, I just need a second to collect myself. Anyways, so what are the what are the questions that uh, I was like? This is like question number two. This is like. Uh, other than, you know, uh, hello, nice to meet you. This was the one that I was uh, planning on asking you next. Okay. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's your brand. It's, um, you know, don't just think about outside the box, destroy the box. And I, you know, I, I'm seeing it on your shirt. I see it even on the, on the side of the side. So visibly it's something that means a great deal to you. Um, I, I'm keen on asking you about, you know, the mission of it, the, the history of it, you know, what, maybe what was the catalyst to, uh, to start this mission. And then I do have some follow-ups for it as well, getting into more like the philosophical side, but at first I want to hear the story of it. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd like to say it has some deep history, uh, of, of meaning. It, it kind of just, uh, came to me one day. It really said, it's funny. There's this envelope right in front of me. I actually just recently... I just recently actually got it trademarked in the in in regards to teaching like an online course. I had to pick and choose, man. Like getting something trademarked is something I've never done before. Here, I'll show it to you. Cool. Um, there it is. Look at there. Destroy the box. United States of America trademark. So I I've never done that before, and that was a long drawn out process to do. But um, but yeah. So it's just like everyone, everyone says, everyone of course says, like, man, you just got to think outside the box. You got to think outside the box. So I decided, hey, man, let's go, <laughs> let's go. Let's go an extra level, right? Like, okay, yeah, you could think outside the box, but dude, just get just completely get rid of the box and kind of develop develop your own life, develop your own strategy. Um, and what I so it it kind of relates to this too. What I like, I think it's really interesting that professionals in all kinds of different realms, whether it's personal finance, real estate, for example, like we talked about, talk to enough professionals. You only need like five, and you'll start to see how completely they disagree with each other in their professional opinions. That's not bad. That's fine. All that means is that there's no perfect way or there's no absolute answer to everything. You know what I mean? Like that's all it means. So that all relates to destroy the box, man. Just like, you know, it's not like everything's figure outable, like take your path, take your steps. And yeah. So don't just think outside of it, destroy it. So yeah, it doesn't have like this deep philosophical past. It almost did. I thought about I thought about getting it tattooed. Uh, I decided not to, but um, so there's that. Well, since I don't get to bring up uh, uh, tattoos uh, all too often on it, this is a good, as good a chance as any to share. So this is the one tattoo that I have so far from uh, Legend of Zelda, or uh, wow. uh, I, I, in in certain parts of the world, um, it, it gets me into um, the gold chapters for the Illuminati. But that's as far as I'm <laughs> going. Uh, so what I what I tell people about getting a tattoo is you already have it. 
it has to be of that significance to you that, you know, if you were to, you know, visualize it, you know, in, in a dream and in a, in a manifest there. So my, my view is going to a tattoo artist is paying somebody to finally reveal it at long last. So that's, that's the, the, the philosophy that I like to share with people is like, I know what my next tattoos are. I got one on my, my right arm. I haven't had that revealed yet. I've got one on my shoulder. I haven't revealed that one. One of my chests haven't revealed that one yet. So that's where I want to be in my head. If I'm going to, um, I mean, even if I don't ever reveal it, it still has a meaning to me. So to me, they're already there, but that's, uh, yeah. So, so I'll just say that's super cool, man. My, uh, so I, I did get one, uh, my first and probably my only, and that actually hurts, man. It hurts pretty bad. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I got mine on the left hand and it was painful. Pretty yeah, brutal. Painful. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was squirming a lot. I wasn't crying. Uh, but yeah, actually hurts. funny, like the, the most painful part was actually the anxiety that came afterwards because it was such a, a, a paradigm shift for me that uh, people were like, oh, this is good. You're not going to get a job now, are you? I'm like, oh my God, I'm not going to get a job. Not oh, that no. I, I would have been a fit for any place I would have, you know, that was not going to be the make or break. Um, and I seem to have done fine anyways, but, uh, it's, it's, it's not just the, 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 the actual jabbing. It's also the, the, the change in the way people are going to perceive you down the line that, uh, I did not see coming. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So the follow-up question that I had, um, as well in, in this story of the box. So we do, obviously we, we, we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, so there is a lot, a, a, an ongoing, you know, conversation about the nature of our, our structured world and the ability for people to break free from that, create their own uh, version of it, you know, however that structure may, uh, may look. And so when I, when I saw, uh, destroy the box, I guess what I was wondering is about is, is it strictly speaking on a personal level, or do you have a vision for what you would like to see maybe even change on a societal level? Ah, man, that's a really good question. So it's for me personally, I want other people to think that way. I definitely have the vision. So this is part of the reason why I'm growing my personal brand, like brooksconquel.com, YouTube, et cetera. So I definitely have the vision of wanting to see, I, you know, I don't have a call to action or is in like a clear mission statement, like I want to see a million lives change or a thousand lives changed in this specific way. Like I don't have that just yet, but I do want to see mass change uh, in the sense for young people for financial literacy, as well as entrepreneurial, like thinking thought and like invoking that into, into our young people. I think both of, both of those things are really important. So I definitely intend to have a role in that, whether it's in my local community online, as I, as I grow my online audience and that gets larger and larger and larger, you know, once, I don't know, once I can touch a million people, then I'll be able to reach, uh, and spread that specific message. I feel like I'll be ready for what it is that I want to, you know, share exactly with, uh, with those folks at that time. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the reason why I wanted to ask that too, is I, I guess my, my consistent position on it is like. I mean, there's different terminology for it. You know, the grass is green on the other side. Some people refer to the matrix. I like referring to it as the matrix. And, and I've never, I'm, I'm not anti-matrix. Like I'm not anti-system. I think it is important for there to be those structures. Uh, my, my, my continuing argument has always been, you know, not everybody has the means to take the risk that involved in becoming an entrepreneur. You do have people who have other people depending on them um, or maybe they just, they're just not cut off for it. They, they don't, they, they just don't want to do it. They've, they've, they've reached a, a, a level of contentment that um, there, there, there's just nothing for them on the other side. And to that, I say, you know, congrats, you know, and, and what it does is it does give the, you know, the entrepreneurs that, that catalyst, that, that kick in the, in, in the rear that says, you know, this, this, you're, you're either rejecting it or it rejects you. And so my, you know, my, my standing position on it is, I don't want to see it go away. I don't know what, what would happen if I think even if it is, um, under, under, under a great deal of control, I think even if it were to be completely, you know, unearthed or removed, another one would be built up in its place anyway. So to me, it's one of those things that's always going to be there so that at the very least it, it is the foil to have something to compare our own paths to. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, a lot in what you just said, but yeah, I mean, def definitely agree. Definitely not the red for everyone. And like, okay, back to my income streams. Most of them, very few of them can stand alone and provide for my family on their own at this time, right? Mm -hmm. So what, like, what does that mean? It means everyone I've produced 
as a, call it a side hustle, call it a spending a per, small percentage of my time. And so if someone desires that, they can totally do it. Just don't put your family at risk, right? Mm-hmm. Have a, like have a job doing something, heaven forbid, at least do something that's cool that you're interested in. Like uh, have, a, have a position and then in the evening time, start your first income stream on something else that interests you or that you, ha- you want to dabble in or whatever. Um, if it can get rolling and make enough income and you want to leave the job, great. If you don't want to leave the job ever, great. You know, like it's, it's so, it's so flexible and fluid, like what it means, you know, to be, to be an entrepreneur or work for yourself or whatever. I, I kind of did it out of uh, necessity because when I first started real estate, I started that company and, uh, with a guy, it's not like I was, it's not like I was exploding, uh, at that time. Obviously we talk about like, you know, my income level, right? So I had to do other hustly type stuff. I've just always been that way ever since, uh, ever since high school, I just remember that's when I discovered, Oh, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of entrepreneurial, you know? Um, that's when I first had that realization. I've just, that's just who I am. It's just kind of, you know, how I've, how I've been for the last since then. I, one, one thing I wanted to get back to bringing up the, the real estate one more for the road. Is, yeah, sure. So one thing that stuck out to me in, you know, when I, when I asked you about the, the, the very real situation of people wanting to um, commit to home ownership and the answer you gave me was, I mean, for one helpful, um, illuminating, okay. but what stuck out to me underneath that too, was, you know, your own stake in it. I think what happens is if people are, you know, 100% dependent on their position, let's say all they were, were real estate. I can't help but wonder if the, if the answer to the question would change because they have their own underlying motivations. The more of a dependency that they have on it, the more they might angle towards a one answer set rather than another. So have, you, have you found that you're, you've, you had this ability to um, really just focus on the, the objective uh, analysis of it? Because if one, if one pillar is, you know, if, if it falls or it becomes dormant, you have all these other pillars. And so you have this sense of, I guess, really stability in, in, in all these different areas that you're working in. I'm sure. Right. Like it's hard to be, it's hard to be uh, subjective because I'm being objective based on my, like, it's the, it's the lens that I view through. Right. Which is why, which is why I said like, yeah, you ask all these different professionals and you'll get differing, differing opinions. Um, clearly someone that's a licensed person like me, but, but their primary vocation is to buy and sell uh, homes for people, their primary residences. Of course, of course, they they promote home ownership. Of course, right? Like, um, so me having a license, but that's not my primary activity. Uh, yeah, I'm. Yeah, that probably does affect my my viewpoint or my lens. Um, by no means, just just to clarify, you know, just just so you know, no one's confused. By no means, am I saying home ownership is a bad idea? By no means. Uh, I think it's a great idea. But I say it just depends on your life goals, your mission. Like, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, how long are you going to be at a property? There's just so many variables to measure before you make that decision of like, yep, this is the right move for me. You know? I, 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 yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, I've only got, I, I've got you for just uh, only really a couple more minutes and then I got to let you go. So okay. the, the last thing I just wanted to hear about, and you know, you're welcome to Cliff notes this uh, to your discretion, which is I, I'm just really keen on hearing about what if any, like what an, an average um, a week looks like to you in terms of let's just like on Monday is happens to be like heavily into real estate. Then by Tuesday or by Wednesday, you've, you've just working on something else entirely. So I, I'm really uh, curious about your, 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 you know, how you manage your, your different areas of expertise. So my week to week is insane and it's always different. So I mean, admittedly, yes, there, uh, I, I came to peace with realizing that like, I'll never accomplish everything that I would prefer to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Um, I had this, it, I wrote this yesterday. So I, I'm, I use so much technology and I use this tool called Trello online, but man, I'm like a pen and paper kind of guy. So this is a list I made yesterday. Use a full sheet of paper, right? Like, um, but what I do, what I do from it is on a daily, on a daily, uh, a day on a daily basis, my habit has be- become to take the giant list of all the stuff that's like upcoming and I'll try to minimize it to like three to five three to five items that that day, I'm like, this is the most important thing that I need to accomplish. 
Now, it could be in um, editing and writing a blog post. It may be creating a YouTube video. It may be going to look at a piece of real estate property, looking at getting a contractor at a property. It may be working on creating an event. It may be working on our magazine project. Every week is totally different. And uh, I've gone through ebbs and flows of very structured, very little structured, whatever. Um, but yeah, this is what works best for me is to have like a giant list. All of it eventually at some point it needs to get done, whether it's like delegated, done by me, someone on my team, whatever. Um, and then I have what's right in front of me today. Like there's three items that are the most that are the most important that I want to try to tackle that day. I, I, yeah, I, I have um, a journal as well. I've been using it for seven years, getting one each year. Uh, but what I hadn't Very done cool. was distill them into what are the key things to get done that day. So that's an interesting takeaway. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take that one with me. The reason why, and, and let me just say this real quick. The reason why is like so you had that big list, right? Of like all of the, all this stuff. That list can be overwhelming. You talked about anxiety earlier. It's so it's ironic how just things on a list can give you anxiety, which makes no sense whatsoever, but it's real that it can give you overwhelming sense. So if you can narrow it down to like literally just a few things that day, now tons of stuff's going to catch your attention. You get a phone call, emails, things that you have to handle, but you can always go back and say, Hey, okay, I've done one of those things. I have two more. Let me go back and focus on number two. It, man, it's, it's been working so well for me for about the last year. It's been really beneficial. Fantastic. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I think Try I even have start tomorrow. At yeah. the right size yeah. too. Yeah, it's good. All right. Well, I I gotta I gotta let you go. Um, okay. It's, it, as it has been um, fantastic to meet you, and and I really appreciate the conversation we had today. Uh, I think there's, we in some sense we've you know scratched the surface, but in other cases we've gone a little you know a little bit. I got to do a little bit of a deep dive, especially in real estate. So yeah, um, it, it it means a lot to me to also know that you know with each episode that I put together, um, it becomes distinct in its own way, and and this episode is no exception to that. Um, the wrap up question is, well, it's always like, if you have like a piece of parting wisdom, you're welcome to share it. But I feel like the mountains beyond mountains things pretty well checks that box. Yeah. Let's so, go back to that. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just use that as the, as the answer to that question. Um, but <laughs> the other side of it is, oh, actually, you know what, I'll, I'll leave it to you. If you want to share another piece of wisdom, go ahead. But other than that, let the audience know how they can uh, look into uh, what you're doing, find you on YouTube and find your web presence. Yeah, sure. I, no, I, I think you're right on, man. Mountains, mountains beyond mountains. Uh, go and heck, go find the video that I did on YouTube. And so that that's actually one of the best ways if folks want to connect with me or see what I'm up to is my website uh, or YouTube. If you, if you Google me, that's probably the best way for you to kind of like click to where you want to go. So Brooks Conkle, B-R-O-O-K-S, Last name is weird. C O N K L E. If you just Google me, uh, find me. YouTube's a good spot, or my website. Well, oh, um, that's everything that we've got for today. So one more thank you for the road, and with that, to my audience, as always, it is an honor and a privilege to collect this information, use it for my own benefit, and then share it with all of you. So with that, thank you all very much for your participation. Take care. We will check in soon. You're still growing, but it's about. The hey, this is Joseph from Ecomonics. Just wanted to thank you for being here and for giving this content your time and attention. I hope you learned something. I can say with certainty, I have learned something with every episode that I have done, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. There's a couple things you can do to help us out. If you want to check out the audio content, we are available on all major podcast platform distributors. And while you're there, give us a five-star review. It helps a lot. And while you're here on YouTube, there's a lot of things you can do to help out as well. It's not going to take very long. Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button for this episode, and hit the notification bell. So when we have new content for you, it's going to be at your doorstep ASAP. Lastly, this podcast is created by Debutify, the best Shopify template available. It is 100% free for you to start, and it can change your life. It can make you so much more free than you are right now. So if this episode wasn't enough to convince you, I think a few more might do the trick. So have at it. <laughs>